Hello all. We have the Euclear Eagles, advised by Christine Backey. We are from University of Minnesota, Kirkson. My name is Ethan Lewis, and I'm a sophomore software engineering student here at Kirkson. Today we were presenting our technical results of the mock lunar environment. Hello, my name is Rena Sakai. I'm majoring in software engineering, and I'm senior. So this picture shows our final rover. We are able to reduce our weight to 100 gram, which we found necessary for being able to climb the test environment. This slide shows the total cost of making the rover. I'm Sheldon Ingalls, a freshman software engineering student. My main role for this was data collection and analysis. Here we have the overall hardware that we used on a rover. So we chose to use uh, only three different sensors for temperature and humidity, pressure, and acceleration orientation, and other data that's provided by an IMD sensor. For our battery, we could not use the 9-volt alkalines that provided because they were too heavy and they could not deliver enough power. We tried three alkaline double A's and they did work. However, they were also too heavy. So instead, we replaced it with two lithium cells, 3.7-volt lithium cells, with a 4.7 U of capacitor uh, in line with them. We used the provide TNZ 3.5, so we downclocked them 96 megahertz to reduce the power consumption. And for communication, we used two XB3s in point-to-point -point communication, which is elaborated in the next slide. Before delving into the exploration, I thought it would be important to talk about the data collection operation. And the sensor data from all these sensors is collected at a rate of 10 hertz. So in a desktop application, which uses data over serial, it displays that data and then saves that data into an SQLite database that we can then convert into a CSV file or query it out. And we get our sensor data graphs that uh, are presented later. Hello, I'm Scott Olson. I'm a sport and recreation management major, and my role on the team was just kind of a learning process as I never really knew any of this stuff before getting onto the team. So today, um, I'm going to talk about what we found inside the cave and out of the cave in terms of rocks and minerals. So here's the cave we went into. And then we found three rocks, different types of rocks and minerals inside the cave. In the top left, the rocks are dark, smooth, two inches in size, almost like river rock looking like. In the top right, they were a rigid, dusty, yellowish color, like a limestone rock. In the bottom left, we have a shiny, easy to move material like aluminum foil. In the same picture, we also have some sort of sand and when leaving the cave and we went up to the plateau, we came across rocks that were similar in size to each other, but different in color. They looked marble-like. The ramp was the access point for our team to reach the mesa or plateau. That was probably the hardest thing for our rover and our team to do. Since we did get into some troubles when climbing the ramp, on our travels going up the ramp, we noticed there's a very slippery, pinkish substance as you see in the bottom left on those images, making it impossible for the rover to drive over it because we didn't have enough traction to go up it. When we attempted to climb it, our uh, rover just slid down it, fell off to the left or right, falling down the thing. We did sustain damage from this. Uh, one of the times, one of our lithium ion batteries fell off and started dragging behind. In our testing, we were able to climb over the ramp, but we did not anticipate substances being on the ramp or even it making us turn while being on the ramp. After a couple of attempts, we were able to get up it with our um, professor's help who went in there and just pushed it up for us basically. So once we got past the pink substance, we were still able to climb up to the plateau. When reaching the top of the plateau, uh, we discovered a mesa. The mesa was covered with pink sand probably. And uh, we wondered if the sand and the pink substance on side on the ramp correspond with each other or not. When we reached the top, we noticed this weird looking obelisk, as you see in the main image, with blue, white, black, shiny rocks surrounding it. When driving up there, we did notice that the pink substance, I mean the pink sand, made it more slippery 
for us to get traction on the planet. We did notice that paint dust got stuck in our gears when we extracted it after we finished doing it. It didn't really affect the performance of the robot or rover, but it was something we didn't expect. Uh, issues we faced during the exploration, there was rocks that get stuck in our gears making, uh, so one of the sides, I think the, the right side of the rover got some rocks in it. So the left side was moving fast and the right side could, so it kept doing like 360s. Uh, there's paint dust everywhere. Like I said, it didn't do anything, just made us have to clean our treads of the rover. We had to do two different explorations because due to the first one not recording the POV of the rover, we had to do another one, and so we had to record data twice and run it twice. But somehow our rover lasted over 30 minutes between those two because we never charged it, so that was good to know. Our design challenges. Our robot originally was too heavy to actually climb anything, uh, so we had to reduce a lot of the weight. So in that first image, you can see that's what our rover was originally. It worked well. It had a lot of sensors on it. I think it had like seven or eight sensors. And so it picked up a lot of data, but it wasn't practical for what we had to do because we couldn't climb up the ramp because the ramp is at like a 45 degree angle or something like that. And we also had a turning camera, which also later on we had to get rid of. Uh, so in the middle image, that's the second stage went down. We went to, we kept the D battery, but removed a whole bunch of sensors, the only ones we needed. That also didn't work. And so our final sign, the one on the right, we went down all the way to lithium ion batteries and it worked great. We lost a lot of weight. We were able to climb up in our testing, but not during the exploration. And turning mechanisms wasn't very useful on the camera that we originally had, because it wasn't very fine control, and you only can go in one direction every time, so you have to hit it once and it goes in one direction. It goes to the left, and then you go to the right, and you can't just like go back and forth. You have to wait, and remove as much weight as possible. Here we've gotten to our sensor data. So we first start with temperature and humidity. Now, as previously expanded upon, there were two separate runs of this, and this is the second run. And in the second run, we had a hiccup with our rover wherein uh, rocks and minerals uh, from the environment actually got stuck in the gears. And so we had to remove the rover, remove the stuff and restart it over again so everything onwards from about 60,000 or 600,000 milliseconds in from data collection is more accurate. However, uh, it seems to, it stabilizes off from there. So rather what the spike is, is it's actually my hand as I was repairing the rover, not actually the environment temperature or humidity increasing. So overall, it seems to be that there is no uh, temperature or humidity increase in this environment. We also collected pressure and altitude. Now, one thing we learned about the pressure and altitude and all these sensors in general is that they're simply not accurate enough for what we would like to do with them. So the idea was to use a combination of sensors, so one of these sensors, to be able to figure out the difference between the ground floor of our uh, lunar environment and anything we would have to climb, since we knew we'd have to climb up to something. We wanted to be able to tell how high we were able to go with that. We thought mm, maybe an altimeter might do that, but it's simply not accurate enough for us to get that kind of data. And again, uh, so we used our IMU sensor to try to generate a 2D or 3D map of our environment, but it simply isn't accurate enough, and especially not for the kind, especially not for the speeds that we were collecting this data at. So the BNO055 sensor can collect at 100 megahertz, sorry, can collect at 100 hertz. However, we're only collecting 10 hertz. And even if we were collecting 100 hertz, it seems to be that there's, we don't uh, quite have the expertise and or um, it's not entirely possible to generate a very accurate map without using some sort of more advanced GPS setup. Lastly, our team member are Ethan Lewis, Scott Olson, Shelby Engel, Rena Sakai, and our advisor, is Christine Baki. That's all our final video. Thank you for watching.